Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners, and welcome to this week's broadcast. We have a very special guest joining us this week, one of our returning champions, the noted author, historian, and good friend, David Nicandri. It's amazing, uh, David Swenson, the semi-permanent guest host of the Jefferson Hour, how long you and I have known each other and how much of that uh, friendship has involved uh, David Nicandri out there in the state of Washington. He's been on this show many times. He is something. He's our go-to guy on the Enlightenment. He has that you know, that large vocabulary, that extraordinary oh, yes, laugh, almost a horse laugh. Uh, he's often amused by what comes out of his mouth. Um, he's one of my dearest friends, and I just want to say this really for, for, uh, with the deepest sincerity. Uh, he's given me something that I did not expect in my life. You know, really, I, I'm a Lewis and Clark scholar. He's a Lewis and Clark scholar. Uh, we found out a, a number of years ago that our minds work in similar ways. That we have we have similar responses to the expedition. Uh, that we're curious about some of the same things that, that, that we're that we want to challenge some of the the mythology and the received traditions of Lewis and Clark and that's a lonely business and there's and there are plenty of critics when you do that sort of work and uh, he's always been a, a champion of my work he's always uh, listened carefully and, and challenged me um, and when he disagrees he, he makes sure that I know as I do when I disagree with him and and you know in Jefferson's time there was something called the Republic of Letters where like-minded individuals across the world found each other and they worked together to pursue the the agenda of the Enlightenment, to ameliorate the condition of mankind and to rethink uh, all of the received traditions of Western civilization. And that's the kind of friendship that I have with David Nicandri. And I, and I have to say, his new book, Lewis and Clark Reframed, Examining Ties to Cook, Vancouver, and Mackenzie, to my infinite surprise, is dedicated to me. And it says to, to Clay really? Jenkinson, my friend and fellow wow. citizen in the Republic of Letters. And when I read that, um, I, I, I broke down because I know what it means to have a book dedicated to you uh, and, and to have one dedicated to me by this extraordinary man um, is just uh, as pleasing as anything that I can possibly say about my career. It's, you know, it's an honor and it's a particularly an honor because it's so unexpected. We're uh, recording this uh, a little earlier than it's actually going to be broadcast, so I'm not sure if the book will be available. Not till the fall, I think. But we'll try to keep uh, people posted on that at jeffersonhour.com. You can go there. And if you do go there, you can support the show. It's tough times we're living through, and, and some of you can and some of you can't, and that's just fine. You can support the show just by contacting us. Let us know what you think. Uh, ask a question, uh, send one in for Clay, send one in for President Jefferson, and we appreciate that too. But we need to keep this program going, and we have every intention of doing that. So if you can help the show, thanks very much for that. There was a section of conversation that we had with David Nicandri uh, post-recording the conversation that is the broadcast, and he made this statement that I just, I loved. I mean, it, you know me, and it came right to me. He said uh, something to the effect of when he was writing the book, he wasn't trying to walk in the explorer's shoes. He was trying to get inside their heads. I just love that. And I really look forward to this book. I want to read it. You have. Uh, I know you're helping him with the editing. So uh, all of these compliments that you gave to him, it's a reciprocal friendship. I think it is. Uh, I feel like the junior partner, but I do um, I do take great joy in that. And, and I've had a role in both of the books. So I was the editor of the Dakota Institute Press that published his first book, on this subject, which was called River of Promise, Lewis and Clark uh, on the Columbia. And now I've had a, a, a role helping to shape a little bit uh, the second book, Lewis and Clark Reframed, and I'm, I'm writing the foreword, which I just finished today. Um, and so I've, I've had this great um, honor of being able to, to slightly help shape the work of this remarkable man and scholar and and that too is um, you know it's unpaid labor but it's it, it in a sense it's pricelessly important you know he, he's the freshest voice in the Lewis and Clark world so much of the Lewis and Clark world is telling the same story over and over and over again yeah, and he's always got these unique insights I mean he that you know, it's like you just said they're telling the same story over and over with you know if you but not in a candry he's like he's got these 
unique insights. The stuff he was talking about in the show is just great. I got to read his book. Yeah. So, for example, uh, there's this famous passage in Lewis at the Great Falls where he says that he wishes that he had the pencil of Salvador Rosa or the pen of, of Thompson. Well, that's sort of just a footnote in Lewis and Clark. But he went to find out where Lewis got this. So this certainly wasn't written in the field. That's his thesis, that most of what we have from Lewis is rewritten much later, polished, refined, made more literary, made more typical of the history of exploration literature. And so at some point, Lewis took his impressions of the Great Falls in, in the center of Montana and turned them into a literary document. And he he points to Salvador Rosa, who was an Italian landscape painter, a very uh, kind of nightmarish, hyper-romantic, somewhat brooding scenes in nature. And he also looks at James Thompson, the Scottish nature poet who wrote a kind of a famous four-part poem called The Seasons. But Nicandri didn't just allow those those phrases to slip by as a simple footnote. He, he tracked them down to their source and discovered that Lewis was working within a well-worn literary exploration framework, tradition, uh, and that we have to see the journals of Lewis as um, sophisticated literary documents, not as sort of unpolished field notes written around the campfire late at night. That's the kind of work that he does. Now, somebody else would say, oh, who cares? Uh, but it actually makes it a much, much more interesting story. Two things before we go to the show, if I might. Yes, sir. One more big thank you to David Nicandri, and I hope our listeners enjoy listening to him as much as I did. And the other is, notable, you blew my cover this weekend. Yes, I've been doing these online courses. So I, I just finished the online course on um, p- pandemics in literature and history, and I'm, I'm just starting um, in, in early June. People can still catch up with this one. There will be a second section on the Enlightenment in six parts. And a week ago, uh, when I was hosting, this is on Zoom, hosting this online humanities course, no credit, just fun, on pandemics, the people said, hey, does David Swenson exist? And if so, might he make a cameo appearance on our next week's Zoom meeting? And I said, look, I can't, I can't even guarantee that he exists, <laughs> but I, I, I will do my best to see if I can get a, like a, a body double or a pretender to come on and say he's David Swenson. And, and then that person did. You, uh, you texted me and I was thinking of that, that exchange between Churchill and who was it? that kept trying to quit. <laughs> anyway, how could I, it was a text. How could I say no? So And you, so and you, you made this appearance and people were like, huh, A, he does exist. And B, I didn't know that he would look Big like deal. that. And I, I got done and realized, you know, that I'd talked about myself way more than I should have. Well, no, that just been quiet. You know, you're like, it was really fun. It you're was an enigma fun. wrapped in a riddle. It was great to see all those faces and see how you, you know, you structure your, your your your, uh, your course and, and of course Catherine was there so that made it worthwhile so it was very much fun and it looks like uh, the people involved in these courses are are very much into it and uh, very glad to be there Rick Kennerly was there I couldn't believe it uh, yeah I, I I will cherish forever the way you saw him on Zoom and said hey Rick and yeah. it was it was absolutely wonderful but just a couple quick things here the the summer Lewis and Clark trip is still on the winter encampments are still on my book. A Repairing Jefferson's America is soon to come out. My North Dakota book is in the works. There are more online courses coming. You're right. We are so thankful for those who are contributing to the Jefferson Hour, in some sense now more than ever. Everyone knows we don't do this for the money, but it takes money to do it. Uh, and so if people are, are wanting to keep this program on and thriving uh, and you have some um, capacity to help us uh, we cherish that and 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 love it we we take nothing from this we 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 do this because we love to do it we you and i haven't seen each other now for months this is a an extraordinary well, i uh, saw you on zoom that was pretty good yeah virtually so, but it's amazing that we've we been able you know, to carry maybe on we should do one of those for uh for the jefferson hour just off the record no i think what we should do is we should we should do a jefferson hour on zoom uh, soon, but we should advertise it on our site and on the Facebook sites, and then you know, say the first X number of people who come can participate in it. But I think it would be funded to actually record one as if live on Zoom at some point, say in early July. Well, let's talk to our tech guys and see if we can pull that off. Meanwhile, uh, we've gone on quite long enough, don't you think? <laughs> 
Absolutely. This is one of my favorites, and the Candry is a really extraordinary man. Once again, his book, Lewis and Clark Reframed, Examining Ties to Cook, Vancouver, and Mackenzie, coming out by Washington State University Press sometime in the fall of 2020. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. I'm your host, David Swenson, and I'm joined by the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. We have a special guest to join us. Clay, perhaps you'd like to introduce him. We certainly do. You know, our dear friend David Nicandri, uh, formerly the director of the Washington State Historical Society and the author of a of a really highly regarded book on Lewis and Clark and a new one in press about Captain James Cook, also has another new book uh, about to go to press, and it's called Lewis and Clark Reframed. Examining Ties to Cook, Vancouver, and Mackenzie. It'll be published uh, later this year by Washington State University Press in Pullman, Washington. And uh, David Swenson, I thought it would be good to talk with uh, our friend David Nicandri and, and, and get a little advanced insight about this book. Hello, sir. Yes, uh, good afternoon, citizens. Uh, it's a pleasure <laughs> to be joining you again. And where are you today, sir? In Tumwater, Washington, uh, the, uh, as we record this, it's May 18th, uh, the 40th anniversary of the eruption of Mount St. Helens, and I'm looking right off into its crater from my porch right now as we speak. So, Dave, the great James Ronda, a mutual friend of ours and, and, and possibly the dean of Lewis and Clark Studies, the author of one of the most influential books ever written about Lewis and Clark, said in his last major public address, which in fact was in Bismarck, North Dakota, a number of years ago, that it's time to stop retelling the story again and again and again, but to get out of the river and over the bluffs and to begin looking at the Lewis and Clark story uh, through the lens of other explorations, through 18th century literature, uh, the Europeanization of the American continent, that unless we adopt a a new set of lenses, we're in danger of of becoming um, self-involved. Well, uh, Clay, uh, I, I think I would slightly correct that to suggest that um, uh, over the evolution of Jim's uh, career, um, uh, he had, um, well, of course, as you, the title of his very book, Lewis and Clark Among the Indians, was in itself a major benchmark in Lewis and Clark historiography because it began to tell the story from the riverbank, not just from the pirogue or the keel boats uh, with the men on the, in the craft looking for the next bend in the river. So Jim in the early 1980s had already almost turned the story 90 degrees from its usual trajectory. But through the course of his public speaking on the topic, through the, uh, the late 1980s, the 1990s, and then once the bicentennial period started after the turn of the century, increasingly Jim would advocate, he'd be going to these Lewis and Clark meetings. You and I were in attendance at many of them. Jim, as if he were a part of this conversation, would quickly agree because he, he came from um, kind of a strict religious uh, theological tradition, and his his remarks would would begin to take on a moralistic tone to this extent, when he would say, it's time to stop looking at the Lewis and Clark expedition in isolation. Now, he had already done the Native American side of that, or at least pointed the way, and there have been many elaborations on that since. But what he began increasingly ref- to refer to was to counter the common perception, the premise or the perception that it was the greatest expedition in the history of the world, that there was nothing like it, that th- this was the, the greatest expedition of all time, that Lewis and Clark had the greatest ex- uh, friendship of all time, superlatives like that. And I think it began to annoy Jim. And at almost every turn from about 1998 until that meeting in Bismarck, which I think was 2013, he would constantly speak to the Lewis and Clark community and say, we have too narrow a focus for the subject. I was inspired by that. My first book on Lewis and Clark, tried to deal with the McKenzie angle. I think I succeeded to some degree. And this new book on Lewis and Clark, because of my subsequent reading of Cook and Vancouver as well, has uh, in- encouraged me, impelled me to widen the Lewis and Clark frame, as it were, not only beyond McKenzie, but to include Cook and Vancouver as well. And uh, bottom line, 
I'm still responding to the clarion call James Ronda stipulated so long ago. So what do we gain by looking at Lewis and Clark through the eyes or through the lens of James Cook? From Cook, uh, we, we, need to, we need to know and we would learn the importance of writing a journal. Well, what we know about the expedition is because Lewis and Clark kept journals. Well, why did they keep journals? They kept journals because the Enlightenment period of which they were a part, it was, it was scientific exploration. It wasn't evangelical uh, in, in orientation. Uh, it wasn't, uh, strictly speaking, mercantile. It was scientific geography. Unless you could point the way through charts and verbal description, textual description, uh, how someone might replicate your path. Uh, it was uh, it was just a it was just a jaunt into the woods. Otherwise, so you had to record what you had seen, where you had gone, you had charted out. That whole template was largely a function of Captain Cook's era, the Royal Navy. And Cook not only inspired geographic exploration in the United States, he did in Spain with the voyage of Alejandro Malaspina, in France with La Perouse. And so uh, Cook popularized many of the idiomatic aspects of voyaging into the unknown. And so knowing how Cook approached it, and, and how he popularized travel literature is an important foundation for a fuller appreciation of Lewis and Clark as well. So I've learned from you in the years since you began to work on Captain Cook, uh, who is a phenomenal figure in the history of exploration, maybe the, the most important single figure in the history of explanation from an Enlightenment perspective. And, and what you taught me is and I've since been able to confirm it in the letters of Jefferson, that the journey is one thing. It's a great thing. It's full of adventure and grizzly bears and native peoples and uh, hair-raising uh, times at rapids and waterfalls and so on, uh, prickly pear cactus and uh, the northern lights and taking um, longitudinal and latitudinal uh, observations and discipline problems and deaths and disease and so on. It's a great, great story, one of the... America's best stories, as James Ronda said, its first great journey story. But that, for the Enlightenment, wasn't the thing at all. For the Enlightenment, the story ends, and then the report begins, and, and the multi-volume report with illustrations and maps and, 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 and data charts, Excel charts of data, that's the expedition. The expedition isn't finished until the multi-volume report appears that synthesizes what otherwise is merely an adventure story. That's absolutely the case and very concisely put. It was all about the report. If a if a explorer went on a journey and never got their words into print describing it, it was as if it ne had never happened. And so uh, a a timely reiteration of what transpired during a voyage of discovery was uh, pivotal to uh, the perceived success of such ventures. And of course, the fact that Lewis wasn't timely uh, in, in his uh, in, in completing his report is a salient aspect of the story. I mean, Captain Cook was a paragon. At, I mean, he would return from a multi-year voyage, write up his journal, his polished account, prepare it for the press, uh, and frequently, frequently was off on the next voyage before that even appeared in print, it was only the last of his accounts, the one he himself was not responsible for writing because he died in the meantime, was the only one that was delayed significantly four years after the voyage concluded in 1780. Uh, so, so therefore, Cook's most, most delayed account of the third voyage postponed, and I use that word in air quotes, by four years, compare that to the, what, eight years it took to uh, uh, get uh, Meriwether Lewis's report in print, and then just barely. So um, those are the kinds of lessons one can, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the people who study Lewis and Clark, a common refrain and point of analysis is Lewis's long delay of getting his report into print. 
I mean, why was Thomas Jefferson pestering Lewis during 187 and 188 about the absence of a report? The answer to that is because Cook was able to get his reports out in two or three years after those expeditions ended. Now, it should be said fairly, Cook had a lot more logistical support and publishing infrastructure at his disposal than Meriwether Lewis did. And as much as as Jefferson hectored Meriwether Lewis about the delay in the issuance of the report, it was actually, one could argue, Jefferson's fault for not providing Lewis with the infrastructure an explorer needed in order to get a book out on a timely basis. And so that's all as it were, Jefferson's fault, at least to a significant degree, not entirely Lewis's. Fair enough. But I want to just make three quick points about this. One is that if you're right, and I think you are, that the the, the mission isn't complete until the multi-volume report is published, then three things. Number one, the Biddle edition that that finally came out eight years later in, in 1814 deliberately stripped most of the Enlightenment work out of the uh, expedition and published a mere adventure narrative. It's a little more than that, but it's essentially an adventure narrative. And that has locked the Lewis and Clark story into a place that it shouldn't have ever been in for 200 years. And so the second point I make is related to that, that whatever James Rhonda and you might say, the vast majority of people who love the Lewis and Clark story are quite happy with the adventure story, the prickly pears and the waterfalls and the scrapes with Native Americans and the grizzly bears and the Newfoundland dog, and they and they and they they don't miss the larger report because they were never taught that there should have been one. They they wish that Lewis had written a book, but but their idea of the book is just a more complete adventure story than the one that we have. And then finally, there's the issue of Jefferson and Lewis. Um, as you say, Jefferson bears some responsibility for not getting Lewis an amanuensis and some research help and 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 giving him uh, focused time and not making him the governor of Louisiana during this period. But for Jefferson, the Biddle narrative must have been a significant disappointment in 1814, and he must have also felt that it wasn't just like a a, a personal problem for Meriwether Lewis that this was a this was a public. This was an enlightenment disappointment that the book had never been published. Very interesting questions. Uh, Gentlemen, we need to take a short break, and when we come back, perhaps uh, David Nick Andre can answer those questions. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation about all things Jefferson. You're listening this week to a very special conversation between the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson, and the noted author and historian, David Nicandri. David, when we took our break, Clay came up with three responses to your statement, and I wanted to give you a chance to respond to that. Yes, thank you, David. And uh, Clay, you made a great point, and I think my only response would be uh, this. Lewis and Clark themselves, or Meriwether Lewis specifically, because I think we have to consider Lewis more than Clark an Enlightenment figure. Certainly Jefferson was. But here's the thing. Lewis and Clark, I write elsewhere, is really, we think of him as an Enlightenment figure, and he is for the most part. But after the French Revolution, the culture of Western civilization was making a turn into the Romantic era. The laconic, objective, empirical description of the cosmos or the world's geography of the Cook era specifically was uh, through the 1790s and into the early 19th century going through an evolution into the Romantic period where the emphasis was, in fact, on the adventure. It was the, uh, the the essence of the Romantics was an investigation of an individual's encounter with nature, not necessarily the description of nature itself. So therefore, Jefferson's instructions to Lewis could have been written in the 1770s at the apex of Enlightenment era geography. But the report was written by a figure who was Lewis, proto-romantic in character, and it was published 
virtually in the in the post-Napoleonic era, where Romanticism was coming into full flower. So the characterization you gave to the Biddle edition of the journals perfectly reflects this evolution. The data, the empiricism, uh, the science, uh, that's relatively unimportant after uh, in the post-Napoleonic era. It is about one's personal encounter. Uh, it's about a, a adventure, kind of the chivalric notions of travel. And so Biddle's account reflects an evolution of cultural taste. If I could go back to the first part of uh, the conversation between you two gentlemen, uh, David DeCandry, you probably more than any historian I've ever talked with understand just how tremendously important the journals these men left are. Uh, you know, you, you based a lot of your work on it. But listening to you talk about it, how unique was it to their time? You know, you talked about how the journals kept during that time were were so much more than just journals. Um, how unique was it to the, to the explorers of that period? Well, an explorer worth their salt always kept a journal. Actually, and this is an important point, David. An explorer, once engaged in the actual work of moving one foot ahead of the next or one oar stroke following the, the last, uh, they weren't keeping a journal. They were keeping uh, a day book, as it was commonly called, or a ship's captain would keep a log, or actually a, a ship's captain more commonly would tell a lieutenant or a midshipman to keep the log, you know, the bearings of the ship, what the temperature was at noon, latitude, longitude, and all of that. Uh, a journal is a polished product. A journal is a second-generation document written in a more studied context. So, for example, Captain Cook, he did not, for example, write his first description of the Hawaiian Islands, not when he died, that was on his return to Hawaii, but when he first encountered them, going north uh, towards Bering Strait, and he just kind of stumbled onto them. I mean, his greatest discovery was a complete accident. But he didn't do an extended narrative about the people he encountered in Hawaii, the various events, until he left Hawaii. He wrote about Hawaii, in other words, when he was sailing towards the northwest coast of America. So Lewis was mandated to keep a journal. Cook was mandated to keep a, a, a log or, or a journal. But uh, what we what came down to us, in, for the most part, in Lewis's hand, isn't his day book. Uh, it's not we don't we don't have what Meriwether Lewis had that sheaf of papers all kind of crumpled up in his buckskins or in his pockets <laughs> with, with, with bear's grease and coffee on it. That that probably served as the foundation for a campfire uh, after he wrote an extended reflective journal that incorporated the, the details that he inscribed in his initial notes. So a, a, a journal was a foundational document. But the important point to remember is that a journal is not a diary of day to day events. It's a it's a retrospective, reflective, somewhat polished account that is a that is the interim stage between the field note and the proto-manuscript that's going to be turned over to a publisher. So are you saying that uh, as a historian, the day book is more uh, important to you than the actual published journal, or is it a combination of the two? They're both valuable, but unquestionably the day book or the log is the more valuable because it's unmediated by retrospective reflection. Oh, certainly. In, in a journal, an explorer would commonly start explaining things well for and because you're working retrospectively one can see how one can flavor the narrative oh i wasn't surprised in a, in, a, in a journal i'm going to make up a hypothetical example in a in a day book or a log an explorer could say i was surprised to run into an ice or a waterfall at this point well on reflection an explorer might want to might not want to convey that they were surprised about anything. So the journal, the, again, the second generation, more reflective uh, instrument would say, and on the, fifth, on the 14th of June, I came to this wondrous waterfall. And then go on to talk about the rainbow and the mist and the sprays and uh, the, the need for a, an artist to properly convey the image. That is the narrative quotient that a journal contains as opposed to a field log uh, or notebook. 
That's a great explanation. Thank you for that, sir. Let me just say to that, um, David Nicandri, that 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 insight that you have, that the the journal that we read of Meriwether Lewis is almost certainly not the field journal or the field notes that he took or didn't take uh, while he traveled from St. Charles, Missouri to the Pacific Ocean and back again, that it's at least a secondary refashioning of whatever was the basis for it. It seems to me two things. One is that's an essential insight into the nature of the Lewis and Clark expedition. It solves many problems that you and I have discussed over the years, but it is not a widely held view. I mean, I I dare say that most people who are lovers of the Lewis and Clark story accept the journals as a dear diary entry produced at the end of a long day around the campfire. Uh, and they, ex- they accept that, that Lewis was just this eloquent diarist who, who uh, on, uh, on the, in the, in the spot of the moment, uh, was able to, yes. to generate the, these, these extraordinary and sublime passages about what he was doing. And as a corollary to that, I would say, we can't go farther in the Lewis and Clark story until we accept your insight. Oh, that's uh, very kind, Clay, but I really need to kind of shift the focus to our mutual friend in common, uh, Stephen Dow Beckham, because Steve in the late 1990s, uh, I think at a point in time where you were down in Portland and I was just coming into the Lewis and Clark story, uh, Steve made a great point in that great book that came, I think it was published in uh, maybe 1998, actually has two of them, The Literature of Lewis and Clark. He wrote the introduction to that. I think it came out in 2003. But Steve had a great insight. He looked at the actual journals that are in the repository in Philadelphia, the American Philosophical Society. And he noted, and in fact, I, I used Steve's great insight in my little story I told David just previously. He looked at the pages of, of, of Lewis's journal, and they're virtually pristine. Everything is lined up. There's no smudges. There's no ink blots. There's no grease stains. And he came to the very logical conclusion, enhanced by the fact that those very same narratives contain retrospective reports of what someone did several days ago, several dozens of miles ago when they were not, when the two parties were not even together, Beckham concluded, clearly this is a second generation product. Whatever this is based on has been lost to history. But to answer your, uh, your to go back to something David Swenson said, both generations of documentation are valuable. But the the unmediated initial thought of the moment, because it because it's uh, uh, it, it's not trying to explain too much because of its immediacy, its lack of historical filtering, those can provide tremendous insights, David, into what is truly going on in the course of an expedition at any one time, if historians have access to it. And that is why, lastly, I'll just say this: in my own writing. When I necessarily have to refer to something like, for example, Meriwether Lewis's great oration upon leaving Fort Mandan on April 7th of 185. What I will say in my own text is an entry appended to April 7th in the calendar, because that is what I honestly, honestly believe is the actual dynamic of journal construction. It was appended to or assigned to the date of April 7th. I'm not suggesting they didn't leave on April 7th, but what I am saying is that Lewis made a note in some some level of or version of documentation that is now gone that said something like left April 7th, left Fort Mandan April 7th at 9 a.m., period. April 8th goes to the next day. It's later that he, he develops this grand narrative that Clay has probably voiced, what, a thousand times <laughs> heading into the land un, uh, untrodden by, uh, by civilization, etc. So that is what Clay was also having given kudos to Steve Beckham. Clay was the one to popularize the construct of the dynamics of journal construction. And indeed, Clay. As you say, until people divest themselves of the naivete that the journals are, uh, are are not a diary, but in fact a constructed literary form, the story will never reach the depths that it needs to. 
Here, here. Um, we were now about to penetrate a country at least 2,000 miles in width, upon which the foot of civilized man had never trodden. The good or evil it has in store for us was for experiment, experiment to determine, and these little vessels contained every article by which we were to expect to subsist or defend ourselves, entertaining as I do the most confident hope of succeeding in a voyage which has formed a darling project of mine for the last ten years, I could not but look upon this moment as amongst the most happy of my life. I guarantee that wasn't written at the campfire. Yes, and I'll, I'll say two things by way of addendum. The phrase, that darling project of mine, that fans of Lewis and Clark just love because it seems so poetic and so quaint and evocative, that was, that was one of Alexander Mackenzie's favorite literary tropes. He used it to describe his voyages to the Arctic and the Pacific all the time. And in that very same paragraph that Clay just voiced, Lewis refers to the voyages of Captain Cook. And that is where all of this gets wrapped up. That's how we must reframe Lewis and Clark within the context of not only Cook and Mackenzie, but also George Vancouver. So that takes us to Mackenzie, and, and this is something that you um, had brought up in your previous book, River of Promise, Lewis and Clark on the Columbia. Alexander Mackenzie uh, uh, traveled across what's now Canada um, twice um, in the 1790s and wrote a book about it, which was published in 1801. Jefferson read that book. It was a kind of a Sputnik moment for Jefferson. We must get an emergency mission out into that country, or the, the British will, through their mercantilism, will will take control of all of the wealth of the American Northwest and maybe have better claims on it, et cetera, et cetera. You broke this story uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, by showing that not only did Lewis and Clark know a great deal about Mackenzie's uh, trips, but they carried a copy of Mackenzie's book, Voyages from Montreal, with them on the journey. And they not only used phraseology from Mackenzie, but they frequently plagiarized whole sections of Mackenzie. Yes, uh, and in that regard, William Clark was the, uh, and Joseph Whitehouse, one, one of the enlisted men, private Whitehouse, were the greater perpetrators uh, in, in terms of uh, plagiarism. But indeed, uh, they often had the uh, the book, uh, Mackenzie's book out in front of them. And the, uh, although, and here's the point, uh, Lewis nor Clark in the million words of the 13 volumes, Molten edition of the journals, they never refer once to Alexander Mackenzie. There's a couple references to Captain Cook, a couple to Captain Vancouver, uh, but none to Mackenzie. Uh, and this is a case where David, again, going back to the, journal, the, the dynamics of the journal, journals, often it's not what's not said is as important as what is said. And the fact that the fact that Lewis and Clark never named Mackenzie by name is, to use modern parlance, a significant tell. And uh, but the giveaway is from the enlisted men. I mean, Joseph Whitehouse, he doesn't have any any dog in the hunt about who is the better explorer, Meriwether Lewis or Alexander Mackenzie which became a great contest uh, in, the, in the press after the expedition uh, uh, is over. I'm referring now to uh, McKeon's, uh, uh, the editor of Patrick Gass's journal. Uh, but White House just bluntly says at, at some point, well, we decided on such and such because we read about it in Mackenzie's book. Meriwether Lewis was never going to say something like that because it derogated his own self-perception as an explorer. Uh, and so, yes, Clay, uh, Mackenzie was kind of, I think of, um, of Alexander Mackenzie as actually the third captain of the expedition. There was Lewis, there was uh, Clark, and then there was Alexander Mackenzie because they were constantly going to the Mackenzie playbook to solve problems and, to, and how to engage with the various indigenous peoples. And, uh, 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 and uh, after the expedition was over, when Lewis started posing – as this greatest explorer of all time, certainly of North American history, Gass's publisher just skewered him for it because uh, David McKeon, Gass's publisher, knew from Gass that Lewis was constantly referring to Mackenzie's journal uh, as his own trail Bible. Boy, that's that's really some interesting insight. You know, it's a uh, you know the an average person who loves this story, listening to this, uh, 
might want to conclude that you're a spoiler. Um, that you're you're <laughs> denigrating Lewis and Clark, and you know, that you're placing them in a bigger context. They're borrowing phraseology. They're borrowing whole poses of the explorer and the the the, the con- going where no man has gone before. But that's not your intent at all, is it? No, it's not. I'm 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 trying to bring some realism again. Let's go back to Jim Ronda. One of his other great notions was that the Lewis and Clark story had all the rough edges had been rounded off. I mean, it, it went, it played out kind of the way it had you. There was no contingency in it. There was no ambiguity. It was this great adventure story kind of along the lines that Biddle, with his severe editing of, uh, of Lewis's handiwork first kind of planted in the American ma- imagination. And that's come down through posterity, especially in the formulation as popularized in our own time by Stephen Ambrose and Ken Burns uh, with his um, uh, uh, with his film on the expedition from uh, dating back to 1997, but uh, th- the story is just simply more complex than that heavily idealized accounting, and to me, it makes it more interesting. I mean, if if I'm a contrarian at all, it's that William Clark was a more significant figure to the success of the Lewis and Clark expedition than the Biddle version, which is, of course, heavily reliant upon Lewis's journal, would would otherwise lead you to believe. And I suppose there, you could say I'm a a bit of a crank, but I'm just trying to give the guy his due. (laughs) That's, That's a good place to take a short break, gentlemen, while we ponder the thought of you being a crank. (laughs) We'll be back in just a moment to continue this conversation between Clay Jenkinson and David Nicandri. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour, this special uh, conversation with Dave Nicandri formerly the director of the Washington State Historical Society, one of our closest friends here in the Jefferson Hour world. You remember his trip with his son up to the northern tip of Alaska last year, and he observed the the great eclipse a couple of summers ago, and and, and we provided an enlightenment report to everyone here at the Jefferson Hour. He's he's our go-to enlightenment guy. And uh, yeah. we've been listening to you, um, David DeCandry, whopper after whopper, you know, saying Clark's more important than Lewis and this and that. I, I would disagree with much of it, but uh, but I'm this is your day, not mine. Your new book is Lewis and Clark Reframed, Examining Ties to Cook, Vancouver, and McKenzie. And, and I want to make sure we, we get it all in here. Vancouver is, is in a sense, the least important of, of that triad that you include in your subtitle. But um, a couple of things. One is that, you, I think, broke some really important new ground in this book. Uh, one is per Mackenzie. I had not read until I read your book that years later, um, Mackenzie wrote a, a very uh, derogatory ac- uh, assessment of of the achievement of Lewis and Clark. Uh, how did you find that? I, I, I can't give you the, the chapter and verse on it, but it does speak to the intense international rivalry between Great Britain and the United States, between the uh, Canadian-based fur trade and how it impinged on Thomas Jefferson's view of the uh, uh, transcontinental potential for the nascent United States. So this was an intense international rivalry. Mackenzie fired the first shot with voyages from Montreal when he basically said, hey, I found a way of encircling the American Republic. We can dominate not only the fur trade, but the future of the uh, the continent if we just build a trade network from the mouth of the St. Lawrence to the mouth of the Columbia River. And the great statesman that he was, Thomas Jefferson responded by getting his own guys out in the field. So in that sense, Mackenzie was was more foundational than Vancouver. But Vancouver is very important for this reason. And it goes back to the silences in the journals. Now, one of my other briefs on the earlier book on Lewis and Clark, and Clay is certainly to take, going to take exception to this. Here it comes. And that is, in my study of the historiography of Lewis and Clark, I, just, I detected a privileging of what I'll call the Missouri River story. 
Now, there's a very good reason for that. Meriwether Lewis's best writing is that from Fort Mandan to the crest of the Continental Divide, Lemhi Pass and the Rocky Mountains. And historians are like any other subset of the human species. They follow the path of least resistance. Meriwether Lewis's writing is at his best, and that Missouri River story from Bismarck to Lemhi Pass is the scent is the core idiom of the Lewis and Clark story historiographically. And that's what most people who think of themselves as students of the expedition know best. Because among other reasons, Meriwether Lewis doesn't write from St. Louis a lot, anyway, from St. Louis to Bismarck, nor does he write much westbound from the crest of the Rocky Mountains. Why is that? Now, people have come up with a lot of theories argued elsewhere that Lewis was just simply, in a phrase, Clay Jenkinson, Clay likes that Lewis was intermittently indolent, which he (laughs) chastised himself for. I mean, he just simply wasn't as rigorous in this regard as someone like Captain Cook. If Lewis had been in the Royal Navy, he would have been court-martialed for not keeping a journal. So let me just leave that there. So he was intermittently indolent, but there was kind of a logic to Lewis's indolence, and that's this, and here's where Vancouver comes in eventually. To me, it is no coincidence that Meriwether Lewis's voice, as translated by pen and ink onto paper, there's Meriwether Lewis's voice goes missing when they go up the Missouri River to Fort Mandan. Why is that? Because an explorer would have thought itself, or any reader, a reader of an explorer's account, would have ridiculed Lewis writing extensively about a stretch of river, nonetheless interesting, we would all agree, but one which fur traders and other explorers had traveled for the better part of half a century. What great adventure is imbued in that stretch of the river? Correspondingly, and here's where I'm going, once Meriwether Lewis crosses over Lemhi Pass and is into Columbia River country, if I can call it, now he's in Captain Cook's territory, Alexander Mackenzie's territory, and specifically George Vancouver's territory, because Vancouver in 1792 detached a subordinate, Lieutenant Broughton, who went up the Columbia River after crossing at the bar to the rough approximation of modern-day Portland and Vancouver, Washington, and uh, rode about certainly all of that 130 miles of river, but also discussed the prospect of the river upstream from there. So I see a parallel between the absence of Lewis's voice Correspondingly, Lewis seems to lose interest in the story when he enters into the next zone where other explorers have already frequented the territory and specifically the lower stretch of the Columbia River. And that is why I maintain we have very little from Lewis once they got onto the Columbia River because he was covering, he thought, in part Mackenzie's River, but also more particularly Vancouver's. And that's why his text is absent and at least in part in my view in the previous part of the conversation you you mentioned something that uh, i had never heard before nor thought about and that was that lewis neglected to mention mackenzie well, one of the explorers of this area that's always fascinated me is david thompson um, does thompson figure in any of this he does kind of thompson had visited the mandan villages you guys home country prior to Lewis and Clark getting there. And Mackenzie actually writes about that in his book. He's best known for having first run the full course of the Columbia River. But he doesn't do that until 1812. Let me just say something to all of our listeners. Uh, You're listening to a special uh, edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. I'm out of character this week. Uh, We're talking with our dear friend David Nicandri of the state of Washington uh, about his new book, Lewis and Clark Reframed examining ties to Cook, Vancouver, and Mackenzie. But but, but David Nicander, I want to say something about our other David, David Swenson. You, I'm sure you know that when Ken Burns produced his uh, extraordinary uh, documentary on Lewis and Clark uh, featuring, in, in very large measure, uh, Stephen Ambrose, um, some of the music of that um, documentary uh, came from the studios of Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. I did not know that. I'm glad to know that. And in my crankiness early in, in this hour. <laughs> I, I, did, I didn't, and whenever I've been critical of other historians' work, I've not tried to suggest 
that it was insignificant or in a way even helpful to my own interpretation. And uh, the Lewis and Clark story, simply put, would not be as popular as we have found it, Clay, were it not for the work of uh, Stephen Ambrose and Ken Burns. So th those uh, venture, those uh, products of theirs are indispensable now to the history of the story. But like all of our works, including mine, they have uh, they, they have uh, flaws uh, and are open might open themselves to criticism. And I'm just uh, doing what is done in the Republic of Letters, which is kind of the thesis, antithesis, synthesis, uh, the the, um, the Hegelian dialectic, which is how we move knowledge forward. Mr. Swenson, um, say a little bit about your own work with Ken Burns. Oh, it was a fascinating time, and of course. Uh um, I, li I like your story of of uh, being admonished by Mr. Burns better. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. But it was uh, it was a great uh, it was a great honor for us. Uh, we got to uh, travel along with them as they premiered the film from from North Dakota all the way to uh, the West Coast, um, and uh, you know the. Uh, meeting Dayton Duncan was was such a special thing. Uh, you know, he's he's the man who really wrote the script for so many of Ken Burns's uh, pieces of work, and um, just a just a tremendous individual, great insight, a real sensitive writer, um, a real sensitive guy. In fact, the favorite line I heard about Dayton Duncan was that he could cry reading a menu. <laughs> I, I complete. I, I agree, David. Uh, Dayton Duncan. I mean, the the actual thread, the storyline in the film documentary is is actually Dayton's work. And of course, he had written a book uh, about Lewis and Clark. Um, um, I'm trying to think of it right now. Um, out west. Uh, oh, out out west. A journey through Lewis and Clark's America. Yes, which is a magnificent book. Uh, well, I'll just leave it there. It was it was a great contribution, and we probably could have used more from Dayton. He also did the writing for the recent country music film that Burns Yes, did. I'm glad you brought that up because that is a masterpiece uh, of writing. I think it's it's one of Burns' best, in my opinion. Yeah, well, and 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 that's what we hear. It's it's, it's a work by Ken Burns, and 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 no slight against Ken Burns. He deserves that credit, but I always want to say. But Dayton Duncan wrote it. <laughs> so back to back to uh, the Cantry's book here for a minute. Speaking of sensitivity, I think my two favorite chapters of the book are about um, Lewis. Naturally enough, uh, I, I take great joy in trying to understand the perplexities and the complexities of Lewis's life and achievement and his death. And you have one chapter on Lewis's homesickness at Fort Clatsop, which I just love. I want you to talk a little bit about that. And then another chapter on his his friendship, which most people are, are sort of unaware of, but before and after the expedition, he had a friendship with a Philadelphia-based lawyer and man of letters by the name of Malin Dickerson. So start with uh, Lewis uh, at Fort Clatsop and his homesickness. Well, on January 1 of 1806 at Fort Clatsop, a very dark, dreary, gloomy winter, uh, uh, Lewis writes a note of, uh, where he starts pining for uh, the time a year's hence. That is to say, uh, uh, January 1, 1807, where he imagines he'll be in the bosom of his friends, enjoying rich viands and fine Bordeaux wine and not uh, half rotten elk and just water. Uh, that's a rough paraphrase. I'm no Clay Jenkinson. So, um, but um, the, the point uh, by telling that story goes back to something we talked about at the very early part of the show and the value of studying other explorations. Again, J James Ronda's great insight. The chief naturalist on Captain Cook's first voyage, the estimable Joseph Banks, I think born the same year as Thomas Jefferson Clay can perhaps verify 1743, that. yes. Later, pre later president of the Royal Society. On Cook's first voyage, after they transited Torres Strait, which separates the northern tip of Australia from uh, New Guinea, and thereby proving that New Guinea, in fact, was not part of Australia. They were separate landforms. That effectively ended the discovery phase of Cook's first voyage. And Banks, in his journal, and he was a great journalist, um, uh, far better 
at that stage than Cook was. Cook learned a lot from him. He was certainly a better journalist than, than our friend Lewis. But in uh, as they are tra- as they are transecting the Era Fura Sea, which is as close to a backwater in the Cook Oeuvre as you can find, he he starts remarking about how the the lassitude and boredom uh, is endemic on the ship, uh, and that only himself, Captain Cook, and Banks's assistant are the only ones who can focus on bringing the voyage successfully home. And he characterizes this by referring to the dynamic as an outbreak of nostalgia. Now, today we think of nostalgia as kind of a a pining for the good old days. That's its modern understanding. But what Banks was writing about in uh, 1770 was closer to that term's original medical roots where it was kind of a severe, melancholy, depressive state. In other words, it was more it was more of a clinical characterization rather than merely a sentimental one. And he said, basically, Banks said nostalgia had broken out on the voyage, except for the people who kept busy. Again, himself, his assistant, and Cook. So uh, having versed myself in Cook, I, I for some reason, I came upon Lewis's New Year's resolution of January 1, 1806. And I read it. I just kind of did a quick calculation of the calendar. And I came to the realization that Lewis, even though he was the commander, unlike Cook, more so than the men, probably more so than than Clark, he was beginning to he had he was beginning to be victimized by an outbreak of the very same nostalgia. He, he didn't really want to be an explorer anymore. He wanted to be home with his friends and family and his mentor, Thomas Jefferson. And that, that fit the classic definition of what Banks was talking about during the course of Cook's first voyage. So here again is another example how by, by studying another expedition, we can shed some light on the Lewis and Clark story. And of course, all of this is multivariant. I mean, I've, you, I've studied other expeditions to provide insight on Lewis and Clark, but you could do the same thing on Vancouver and Mackenzie based upon Cook, if you follow my drift. So that was what, that's what I was trying to uh, investigate with that chapter. And in my own book on Cook that's coming out later this year, Captain Cook Rediscovered Voyaging in the Icy Latitudes, I employed Banks's typology, and I came to the conclusion that at the same intersect on each of Cook's three voyages, at about the two-year mark, the, the enlisted men, the, the more junior members of the party began to get disaffected. They began to be, as you, if, as you were, David Cranky. They were having more. They were having more beachside troubles with the with the uh, Polynesian people, and so uh, it's, to me, it was no coincidence that you had episodes on the return journey, like Lewis's fracas with the Blackfeet, his burning of of Indian canoes on the Columbia River, getting shot in the arse. Those are all characteristic dynamics that one finds when a voyage of discovery reaches its anticlimactic phase, which Joseph Banks was the first to delineate. I am so sorry to see this conversation come to an end. I've so enjoyed listening to you speak. Uh, Clay has had the pleasure of reading the chapters of your book, but what about the rest of us uh, commoners? When when can we read it? Well, the book should be out by uh, by uh, after Labor Day. I'm guessing September, October. One should check um, Washington State University Press's website. Frequently, Presses will have a pre-publication sale, and uh, they, also on Amazon at the appropriate point. I can report they're actually by by Cook Publisher, University of British Columbia Press, is already doing a pre-sale on the Captain Cook book. So listeners, listeners can get in line. We'll try to uh, update our listeners at jeffersonhour.com. And thank you so much, sir. Thank you. It was a pleasure joining you, gentlemen. David McCandry, the author of Lewis and Clark Reframed, examining ties to Cook, Vancouver, and Mackenzie. We didn't get to all that we wanted to talk about here today, but it's a rich book. And, and, and the takeaway is this, that so far from these other subjects being a distraction from our focus on Lewis and Clark, they actually enrich our understanding of Lewis and Clark. And so this is the best sort of scholarship, and it's um, and, and nobody uh, in the Lewis and Clark world does it as well 
as David Nicandri. So thanks for joining us, and we will see all of you next week for another important edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson. Thank you.